Hi. So I'm Jeff Epstein. I'm from Parallel Scientific Labs. Uh, these days, we're specializing in interesting distributed type problems, especially in Haskell. Uh, and you can hire us. So let me know if that's interesting for you. Um, so today, I want to talk about talk with you about a project we've been working on for the last a uh, little bit more than a year. Uh, it's called HA. Uh, HA stands for High Availability. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we did this, what kind of tools we used. Um, one of them is Haskell. Uh, and some problems that we faced and how this relates to our tool set. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please just stop and interrupt me. That's fine. So HA is High Availability. It is a, a middleware for managing um, very large networks. The goal is to manage exascale networks, where exabyte is the thing that comes after, what, petabyte, I guess. Um, so very large networks with up to uh, tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and the kind of issues that we're facing is stuff like this. Imagine that you have tens of thousands of uh, computers networked together. Um, you need to have them agree somehow about which services are running where, uh, what the state of those services is, um, which nodes are operational. Maybe some nodes have failed. As you have very large clusters, increasingly you're, you're going to have the likelihood that some number of those nodes will have failed and need to be replaced. Um, so we need a way to achieve consensus within the cluster about which nodes are working, uh, which services are running on which nodes, and the state of those services. Um, the whole project was architected by my colleagues uh, Matthew and Peter. Um, and the performance should be reasonably good. Um, we're not dealing with huge amounts of data. Mainly we're dealing with messages between nodes about some sort of status update. Um, there's existing systems that fill this kind of niche. Uh, Zookeeper and Chorusync are the ones that we looked at. They don't scale as well as we would like. Yeah? What didn't scale about um, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, let's talk after. Um, uh, so, the way HA is structured is we have a bunch of nodes that are actually running services, which I'm calling user nodes here. Um, and they generate an event. An event could be a change in status of a service, it could be a failure message. Something has happened that we need to let the other nodes know about. And ultimately, these will be managed by what I'm calling the HA station. Uh, so all these events filter up towards this hierarchy at the bottom. Um, the message will be aggregated by proxies along the way. So we have a, a, a three-level hierarchy. Ultimately, all the messages will reach the HA station. When they reach the station, it's important that we queue these events. Um, and it's important that the queue is replicated so that if the system handling the queue fails, we don't actually lose the event. So before the event is acknowledged to the originator, the node that's actually trying to send the message, it's replicated to uh, more than one system, reducing the likelihood that all of the nodes that are holding this, uh, this message will fail. Um, so replication is going to be a key theme in this presentation and how we handle that. So once the message is queued, it's now stored in a queue on several systems in the box called HA station, which represents a group of nodes. Um, there's a process called the HA coordinator. This is the primary decision-making apparatus. It decides, based on certain events, what do I need to do? If a service has failed, do I restart it? Do I have to reconfigure it? Do I move it to some other host somewhere? Do I shut down that particular system? Do I notify the administrator? Um, that's all handled by the uh, coordinator. There's only one of these. It pulls messages out of the replicated queue uh, and takes some sort of action. And one of the actions that it may take is updating a shared state graph representing the state of the whole cluster, including which services are running where, which nodes are working, and so on. Um, and that state graph is also replicated. So we're replicating two big things, the event queue of things that are happening that need to be processed by the coordinator, and the current state. And again, it's replicated so that if any of the systems that make up the HA station fail, we can pick up where we left off. We can simply start a new HA coordinator on a new node. It'll have access to the old state of the queue 
and the graph. With me so far? OK. So this is a, an example of what a graph might look like. Uh, it stores the state of the cluster. Uh, it just says, oh, we have certain nodes, and certain disk arrays are connected to certain nodes, and they're up or down, what have you. It's a graph. Um, how did we do this? So the important parts I want to touch on are we used Haskell. You've heard of Haskell. Cloud Haskell, which is a library on top of Haskell, which I will talk about in detail, um, and uh, a distributed consensus algorithm called Paxos. Uh, who has heard of Paxos? Oh, fantastic. OK. Um, so let's talk about Haskell first. Um, of the many interesting features of Haskell, the ones that I think uh, played a key role in this, uh, the functionalness of Haskell. The state graph is represented as a functional data structure. Uh, the replication of that, when we want to make a change to it, we can make that change in a functional way, uh, but we have to actually transmit the updated version of the graph to the other hosts that make up the HA station. And that's done imperatively. And in fact, it turns out that a lot of our code turned out to have a very imperative feel to it. Um, and this is probably a consequence of the library that we're using, Cloud Haskell, um, and uh, uh, some other issues. Um, so you look at our code, but it doesn't seem very functional. Like there's bits of it, but it doesn't really, it's not capturing that essence. Um, we're all big fans of very strong typing, and that was extremely useful. Um, I don't need to sing its praises. You all know how wonderful strong typing is and how easy it makes uh, uh, refactoring and other big changes. Um, and then there's laziness. So uh, we just heard laziness can cause all kinds of problems. Um, it caused problems for us, too. Uh, we had space leaks, which are tricky to track down. Um, and especially, I'm not really sure how laziness, laziness fits into a distributed environment. So when you have multiple nodes, and they communicate by sending messages to each other, necessarily, sending a message means you serialize the data, you send it, and you deserialize it. And the serialization is a forcing function. So that breaks laziness. So any time where you have some sort of distributed computation involving sending a chunk of data from hither to thither, it means you are giving up laziness. Um, and especially you wanted to enforce the abstraction that if we have two processes communicating by message passing on multiple systems, we should be able to move them to the same system as well, and they'll work the same. So the abstraction of having two processes should be independent of where those processes are located. To maintain that abstraction, we have to make sure that even when two processes are located on the same host or in the same operating system process, the messages are still serialized when they're sent. Otherwise, you have the case where uh, you have divergent behavior based on where the processes are located. So we ended up forcing a lot of data. Um, and I'm not really sure how you could get around that, given the parameters of the project. Um, we like Haskell. <laughs> uh, Cloud Haskell uh, is a library built on top of Haskell. Now, we've already heard a couple talks today uh, about a distributed actor-based message passing type communication framework. Uh, we had a talk about Erlang. Uh, we had a talk about Scheme. Um, and Cloud Haskell is the same idea. We're taking the good bits of Erlang, this idea you have these lightweight threads that communicate only by sending processes, uh, sending messages, with no shared data. Um, and we're bringing that uh, into Haskell. Um, this is not a language extension. This is a, a, a regular library. Um, uh, and uh, my font got very big there for some reason. Um, uh, so this is a really a key part uh, in our project. We use this a lot. Um, and it really worked out well, actually. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we're familiar with the abstraction. Um, this was originally from my MPhil thesis. Um, since then, it's been com completely rewritten um, by some wonderful people. Uh, the new version is much better uh, than the old one. Um, and it actually captures a lot of uh, the essence of Erlang without actually being Erlang. 
um, with some caveats, which I will touch on. This is the big slide here. Um, so let's go slowly. Um, so first of all, I think that the Cloud Haskell programming model is a good fit for this project. Um, it's very easy to conceptualize these interacting components, these blobs in a flowchart, sending messages to each other. Um, so it's a really nice abstraction. Um, moving around these various blobs uh, is also easy. Um, I should point out, though, that although we're handling, this, this is a big data project in the sense that we're managing a network with, uh, large, uh, with an exascale network, this is not a big data program, which is to say that lots of data is not flowing through HA. In other words, uh, Cloud Haskell is not being called upon to serialize and send big messages. Um, and that's good because it's very bad at that. Um, the messages that we're sending are uh, of the order of, hey, this service died, or please restart that service. Um, coordination messages. Uh, so we're not sending huge amounts of data. Um, and if we were, then I would say that Cloud Haskell is not a good choice. Um, another parameter of the project is that we were not running this network over regular TCP. Um, we had a proprietary uh, uh, protocol, which is based on an InfiniBand, um, which can get uh, much better performance than TCP. Um, and we had the challenge of uh, making Cloud Haskell work over this protocol. Um, so out of the box, Cloud Haskell is built for TCP, but it also supports pluggable backends. So you can build um, a, theoretically, you, you, can, you can build a backend for Cloud Haskell, so the same programming paradigms apply, but it's sending messages over some other arbitrary protocol. Um, in this case, the protocol we were using had some very different properties than TCP, and we had trouble matching the semantics that the Cloud Haskell backend interface expects to the actual hardware interface. Um, that was problematic. It continues to be problematic. Um, there were a lot of bugs involved in that, uh, including some more space leaks. Um, in some cases, the semantics required by Cloud Haskell were stronger than we needed. In particular, Cloud Haskell takes on uh, the airline tradition of guaranteeing message ordering. Um, so if you, have two, if you have two processes, and process A sends uh, messages, two messages to uh, process B, you know that they will be delivered in the order that they were sent, if at all. Um, it turns out that for this project, we didn't really need that. Um, we had our own ordering properties that we wanted to enforce, and it would have been much nicer if we could turn off the built-in ordering properties uh, required by Cloud Haskell. That made it much harder to build the back end and probably reduce the performance of the application. Hi. Is required by Cloud Haskell or by TCP? Oh, we're not using TCP. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, but but the, the Cloud Haskell interface expects that uh, the messages will be ordered anyway. Um, another issue we had with Cloud Haskell is how to bring up the cluster. Um, uh, so the, the default out of the box behavior for Cloud Haskell is basically you have a bunch of uh, nodes in a cluster. They send a UDP broadcast to announce themselves. Um, and then they all know where they are. Uh, this doesn't work when you have 10,000 nodes, and it doesn't work over our networking infrastructure. Um, so we had the challenge of adapting some other way to uh, how to uh, dynamically set up a cluster configuration. Um, and the best we could do, really, is you have a static file identifying the location of all the nodes. You SCP this to all the nodes in question. Um, they read that in, and they know where they are. Even so, um, there was an ugly hack involved in actually uh, contacting a process running on a remote node, even if you know where it is, uh, because Cloud Haskell likes to uh, uh, randomize its listening ports. So we actually had to have a fixed port, uh, which I, we could then query to find the actual port where we could contact the process. Uh, it's an ugly hack. Um, I think I've covered everything here. How am I doing for time? Ah, uh, right, okay. Um, so we all know about Paxos, um, and this was really uh, a key component. Hi. Yeah. Is the main benefit of, why not use Erlang? Is the benefit of the strong dynamic 
typing. Right. So uh, yes, we really like the strong typing in Haskell. Um, uh, uh, that's a big thing. Also, um, we did some tests with Erlang and found the performance was not really up to our expectations. Um, uh, it's uh, Haskell does compile to, to native code, um, uh, and also for for so for doing any kind of uh, file type stuff, talking to local file systems, uh, it was a lot faster. Uh, it's jitted, I guess, maybe. Really? Okay. Maybe I've been misinformed. Anyone know? Okay. I, I guess. I guess yeah, you know. I, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, uh, right. So, Cloud Haskell w w was a mixed bag, a nice abstraction, but with some technical hurdles along the way. Um, so, you know about Paxos. Um, so, if you don't know, Paxos is an algorithm. It's uh, pretty well known in the distributed world. Uh, it's been proven um, mainly by this guy, Lamport. Um, the idea is when you have multiple systems and you have to make them agree on something. Um, so this forms the heart of our consensus, of, of our replication algorithm. Um, and again, we replicate two big data structures. We replicate a event queue and we replicate the state graph. Uh, so changes to the state graph are represented as uh, functional uh, mutations on that graph. Um, once we get all of the uh, replicants to agree on a particular uh, modification, um, we can commit that particular change. Um, similarly, uh, to the event queue, the important operations are insert and remove an item from the event queue. But before we can actually commit to that, we have to make sure that all the replicants agree. Um, I should say not all the replicants, but a quorum of the replicants. Um, at any point, it's allowed for some number of the uh, replicants in the HA station to fail. That's OK, um, as long as we have a majority. And it's important to have a majority so we know that we don't have a split brain going on. Um, they're essentially voting. Um, so we implemented Paxos as a general purpose library on top of Cloud Haskell. This is actually a fantastically good match. Um, if you read the, uh, uh, the Paxos papers, um, it's described in a pseudocode where all of the elements of Paxos are represented as uh, processes that communicate by sending messages. Um, these processes are called the client acceptor, proposer, learner, and leader. Um, and um, we actually got an extremely small and extremely readable implementation of Paxos for an algorithm that is allegedly notoriously difficult to implement. Um, and actually, our final code wound up being very close to the pseudocode in the papers, which is reassuring in terms of how we feel about correctness. Um, uh, it was not entirely without speed bumps. Um, Debugging it was actually very tricky. Um, in particular, I should mention uh, a interesting point uh, on how Cloud Haskell compares to Erlang. Um, in Erlang, when you're receiving a message, so each process has its own independent message queue, uh, and you extract messages from the queue based on uh, pattern matching. Um, in Cloud Haskell, uh, instead of matching on a pattern of the value of an incoming message, you match on its type, which is almost the same, sort of. Um, this has problems, though, when you're doing polymorphic types, because the polymorphic type that you're extracting has to match exactly the message that's in the queue. Uh, and sometimes Haskell doesn't infer the type that you think it should infer. Um, so you have the case where you're sending some sort of polymorphic type uh, M of foobar, uh, and you're expecting a type uh, M of bar, and that message never arrives. Um, and you're very confused for days until you figure it out. Um, the other thing is that uh, Paxos is not quite as simple as it is in the papers to actually get right. Um, liveness is a big issue. Uh, so this means if you want to get good performance and not have uh, nodes be excluded uh, uh, from, the, from uh, the consensus unnecessarily, uh, you have to apply some heuristics which really depend on your application and trial and error. Um, and we're still working that out. Um, 
So it's not simply a matter of implementing it according to the paper. There's additional work you have to do depending on your goals. Um, Multi-Paxos is a refinement of Paxos, uh, which is uh, published, but uh, we're also working on more specific stuff. Um, so, debugging. Um, getting this all working was a challenge. Um, the static typing helped, but it was also uh, harmful in the case of the uh, message matching in Cloud Haskell. Um, one advantage of using Cloud Haskell, as I mentioned before, it's easy to do, uh, debug this. So when this is actually deployed, it could be running on thousands of nodes. Um, in our test environment, it could be running on tens of nodes, but you can also run it on your own notebook. And this is possible because of the abstraction maintained uh, in messaging. When you want to send a message to another process, you have its process identifier, and you send it a message. And the process identifier could represent a process running on the local host or on some other host. And the Cloud Haskell backend takes care of resolving where that is. So you can easily fold up a big distributed program, throw it on your notebook, and have it allegedly still work exactly the same. So putting together a quick test environment is not as bad as it might be uh, in other distributed environments. Um, but there were missing messages, as I mentioned before and all kinds of tricky race conditions. Um, what we really want to help track this down is some kind of distributed thread scope. Something where we can see all of the processes going on in a whole uh, Cloud Haskell application, see exactly what they're doing uh, at any given time. We don't have that. We had to rely on pouring over logs. Um, we, uh, an interesting uh, hack we had, which I think is actually pretty brilliant, um, we built a deterministic Cloud Haskell thread scheduler. So this is not uh, a Haskell scheduler, in the sense that it does not actually touch the GHC runtime. Um, what it does do is it applies deterministic behavior to the uh, uh, messaging between processes. Um, so uh, this actually made it a lot easier to track down um, possible uh, race conditions between messaging processes. Um, and also we did apply uh, to check our replication algorithm, we did actually build a model in Promela, which is a uh, verification language. Um, and that uh, helped us, helped assure us that at least our algorithm is sound, even if our implementation isn't always as sound. Hi. I'm saying that we don't depend on ordering of messages. Um, that's it. Any questions? Hi. Thank you. If it were up to me, all of it. Uh, in reality, probably nothing. So, so the, the deterministic scheduler is strictly for testing. That's not something that you actually deploy in a, uh, a production environment. Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>